Nickel. Eh ben, bonsoir à tous. Euh, à titre personnel, je remercie euh, le CADTM pour euh, l'invitation à participer à cette, euh, à cette conférence. Merci, merci à tous et à tous. Merci à CADTM pour m'inviter ici. Et l'invitation à modérer, je ne sais pas si c'était ce que j'étais expecting, mais en tout cas, les trois experts que nous avons sont des grands spécialistes sur le sujet de la mort. And they are the all three of them have made great efforts. They are great pedagogues, they're great teachers on these issues, and we could speak for many hours with them without any risk. And uh, here I'm just uh, moderating the exchanges as best I can. So if I can. Uh, moderate as best possible so as to ensure that everybody can express what they mean to say then that would be great and if ever you need to go into greater detail then please turn to them and uh, so we're talking about debt today and public debt more specifically and i'll be quite brief here in just saying that the presidential campaign for 2022 has had to well we've had to look at some key issues on the on this question so we've been looking at how we can measure what has been happening in the last period now not everybody is has their eyes locked on france but at least what we can see is that economic and social activities and issues have been at the heart of issues and the election campaign, uh, building Europe, and the need to reimburse debt, uh, and in what deadlines, etc. Well, the, the discourse of the left has been important, and it has been very important. So we have seen the, the Front National coming in in France, and we have seen the Front National, the National Front, has been speaking loud and clear. And I imagine everybody knows this, they're aware, all of those who are here are very much aware. And five years later, we see that things have moved forward hugely. So debt has evolved immensely and French debt uh, has gone above 100% of the GDP and it is now over 120% of GDP and um, Now we can see that political campaigns are being organized around a number of issues. And what we can see is that these changes on, number, on a number of issues, which uh, speakers will touch upon this evening, is, well, firstly, why is it that the European population have so violently discovered the issue of debt over the last few years. In the last few years, they had understood that uh, this was an issue for the South of Europe. And the debt that we hear about in the media, this uh, media discourse that we hear about so much, we heard so much that it should not go beyond a certain threshold and that there's a risk of uh, throwing everything into turmoil and why is it now that well we here now at uh, any cost resolving anything at any cost but how is it that we can ensure that debt which has become so big in terms of costs how can we ensure that it actually is resolved and then i tried to describe the evolution of the campaigns that have taken place in france and How can we think about the actors in France, key actors in the drama? So we have the European Central Bank and the situation that we have nowadays invites us to measure the activities of the European Central Bank, which up until now have been the guarantor of debt. And now, uh, well, I can finish with this introduction and. Now I can pass over to the three speakers who are very much uh, ready to speak about 
three issues that we agreed upon, and I'll introduce these, and uh, they have, and then we will have a questions and answers moment, and so we hope to hear from you. So first of all, we have Eric Toussaint, who we invite to speak, and so Eric Toussaint on a video video conference like this, organized by uh, CRDTM, well, he's a historian, he's a founder of CRDTM, he's a spokesperson, and he has written many books, and we have uh, a number of them. Uh, alternatives are possible, for example, in and a number of books that have been published recently, and so really I would invite you to read those. And we have Aline Fares who will speak afterwards. And uh, I hope I'm not confusing the surname here with somebody else. And I hope that uh, so Aline has worked a number of years in, in finances. I will issue that uh, uh, 2011. And she worked with Finance Watch as well. And um, she has worked with many actors in Belgium and France, and she's contributed to the creating of many bodies that contribute to finance issues and thinking about key issues. And now we have Benjamin Lamoine, who is a sociologist who has worked on key issues in terms of debt, a survey on debt and the possibilities for markets and a new edition that will be released soon. And each person will speak for about 15 minutes, one five minutes, and Matt and uh, the whole team of CADTM who are organizing this this evening, and I count upon you, I rely upon you if ever I make a mistake, but uh, over to Eric. So the first question, the first question that I wanted to ask you is on what I described just now. So the huge amount of capitalist debt that we're seeing and the paradox or what could seem a paradox when we compare these amounts and uh, we're talking about 120% for French debt and uh, we heard about the threat that debt represents and the current situation as it is now and the economy seems to be upside down. So how can we speak about this unique situation that we find ourselves in right now? Over to you, Eric. Vous m'entendez? C'est bon? Oui, c'est bon. Euh, mais très heureux de participer à, à cette euh, discussion et modéré par euh, Renaud. Uh, Thank you very much. A great pleasure to take part in this discussion moderated by Renaud. And uh, so there's a certain affirmation, there's a certain statement which says that it would be a, uh, it would be a disaster if we went beyond a certain amount of GDP. And this is lacking in scientific credibility. This is a statement which has been launched by Kenneth Shapov who was a chief economist of the IMF, and one of his students proved that actually this is completely without any scientific founding. And Knetrukov said that if that goes beyond the uh, fateful figure of 80% in comparison with GDP, well, it's uh, terrible, it's unsustainable, etc. Well, that was, that is clearly false, and it was false right from the get go, according to what he said, because we have it, the examples of Japan with uh, debt going beyond 200% of GDP. So it's not an issue of percentages, it's not an issue of public debt in comparison with producing. A wealth each year. No, that's never been an issue for CADTM, for the members of CADTM, and it has not been the case for most critical analysts. But when we see 
the issue, then what we really have to say is that the statement, that statement was completely false. And what they had in mind was to justify austerity policies and certain limitations that needed to be imposed on debt. And at this moment in time, it's clear, as you have said, Bruno, in the uh, introduction, that there is a clear need for a clear break. A clear break. There was a clear break in March 2020 in terms of the discourse. So Christine Lagarde became the head of the UCB, and she was the former, and then we have the former head of uh, the ECB, Mario Draghi, they showed a united front to say that there is indeed an issue here and that they did not take the issue from, well, uh, they, they said whatever it takes, whatever it takes in order to combat this crisis. And they explained that this crisis really comes from the fact that the world, the world's population is affected by the pandemic. And as economists, we know that the, that really we, that the economy did not recover from the, 20, the 2008 uh, crisis. And we have seen very slow growth since then. And there are very clear signs that with a, with a reduction of growth from the United States, there is uh, there is uh, what we see as signs of the Federal Reserve making moves in certain directions. And it's very clear that the pandemic has led to, uh, well, we've seen lockdown in China and elsewhere and uh, all over the world. And all of this has changed the situation completely because we see uh, halts on the production chains and uh, as I explained in an article, and I'm not going to go into the details, but if you have big um, investors, big shareholders, then those people decided that in February until mid-March, they decided that they were going to look at their profits. So really, they said that the shares had risen so incredibly in value, and those who buy these shares, these big shareholders that had shares at the beginning of the movement of uh, the big share market, they said, let's sell this at, at sale price. And this has led to a loss, a big losses. The losses took place. And then we said, we're going to buy these at a lower price. And this is a very good operation. So that was between 15th of February and 15th of March. And then from 15th March onwards, the European Central Bank said, okay, it's not actually the case of the pandemic, it's a 30% drop in the value. And so this was a threat that was coming from the financial markets, from the European Central Bank and the reaction of the European Central Bank and others was to say, let's go right in, let's go full in. So whatever happens, we're going to do whatever is needed to save the financial markets, the shareholder markets. And you shouldn't say it in that way. That's, well, that was the, the message sent to the markets. But really, it should be, well, we need to tackle the effects of a horrible virus. So what did they do? They said, and I'm particularly speaking about Europe now and uh, Europe later on, uh, sorry, USA later on, they said that the treaties are suspended. The, the implementation of the treaties are, is suspended and you can indeed go as far as you like in terms of public debt increases. And why did they say this? Well, I'd say for two reasons. Firstly, they needed to respond to the pressure of the markets and say that this is what we're facing. We have indeed understood that there could be serious destabilization to the situation. And therefore, we need to inject enough money so as to ensure 
that the stock markets can uh, get going again on the rise. And then secondly, the other objective was to say, well, I don't know if this will surprise you, but the ECB and the European Commission, they said that we have to ensure that the states do not decide to finance their expenses by financing the rich. Now, that, by, that was a very good idea. So they needed to calm down the storm that was happening and indeed say that, look, the well-being state, uh, well, there will be help, there will be subsidies provided, there will be debt, for, there will be support for private debt and for paying off debts, and we're going to provide help. We're going to keep the people happy in this sense. And what we're going to do first and foremost is to ensure that the expenditure we have, well, those who have made profit from this situation up until now, we can see that the level of inequalities had indeed increased. And there had been the Occupy Wall Street, the indignant, the Andinier, the 1% movements. Well, but what we wanted to ensure was that We wanted, uh, one wanted to ensure that the money didn't simply be sunk. And by opening up the water gates of the, of saying that you can uh, indebt yourselves as much as you like. So the States, there was pressure from the left. And as, as you said, Renaud, there was, there was maybe certain pressure to a certain degree and the states could have taken measures and to a certain degree macron and others they said well it would have been good to regulate it would have been good to uh, regulate big pharma the big pharmaceuticals etc and so we could have said that there would be feedback from the large-scale politicians to say that this would be the case or that would be the case but Really, when we look at the calculations being made, if we look at what Christine Lagarde was saying and the governments of those persuasions, they would, well, we could see that there would have been a certain congratulations for the European Central Bank saying that we are not going to leave by the wayside our dogma. And there are friends even that have said this friends of mine who have said this and i think this is not the right reaction to take and so the european central bank what did it do well just look they injected two billion euros in companies and large companies and how did they do this well they bought public debt private debt and they put that into the banks and you know that the states they need to send they need to sell their shares the primary dealers who then resell it on the secondary market to other banks and to other investments and it's only afterwards that the central bank would intervene and actually buy from these investors well investors is uh, is a big word we should really say speculators that's not really the right word really their speculators and it's only then that they can buy the debt from the private sector and they bought a lot of that debt so two trillion euros and at this moment in time you can see this on the website of the european central bank and month by month you can see the purchases of debt you can see debt programs you can see uh, pandemic emergency program, for example, so buying debt, a buying debt program which was linked to the pandemic, and the ECB bought uh, bought a huge amount for trillions, and they and then through the same program, well, they had a quantitative easing exercise which uh, and which went to the tune of 2 billion euros. So these are previous 
purchases which are renewed. So what we can see is that the ECB holds 25% of the debt of Euro states, and uh, we check this on the ECB website, and say, really, it's 25% uh, of the Belgian debt, of the Italian debt, of the Spanish debt, etc. So here, the ECB created money, uh, let's say two trillion euros, and they were asked to create money for other things, but no. They created it. Okay, so great. Then they used this amount of money to buy public debt, private debt, and also structured profits, which are, go under the acronym of ABS, which are, come from the subprime mortgage crisis of 2008. And this money on the secondary was on the secondary market and that goes to markets because the European Central Bank also buys uh, Volkswagen, Auchan, Le Roi Merlin, uh, lots of different private companies. They buy the debt from those, but mainly public debt. So this money that was paid by the European Central Bank. What has it been used for? Well, well, it was used supposedly to relaunch the economy, to increase money for small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, to do what Christine Lagarde asked for, and to have productive activities taking place in several different areas. But no, it wasn't used for that. No, it was really speculation that happened with this money. And we can see that things went on the rise with these investments and they they reached a level which was beyond the levels of 2007, so before the previous crisis. And this wasn't enough. They had loads of money and so they said, we're not just going to work on the shares, we're going to work on raw materials as well and so a relaunch can take place, but there was speculation on raw materials and that shot up and we saw uh, a shooting up in terms of hydrocarbons in particular. And more recently, we saw speculation really happening strong on property, real estate, and we saw that that happened to a strong degree in certain countries. And then the countries, the banks, the banks actually brought back lots of public debt, public debt. And with the money of the ECB, they were buying public debt alongside what I mentioned, so public debt, but why? Because these are safe investments and the bank is doing badly. And so Aline can speak about this later on, but really uh, it's a bad situation. And so things go badly, they cover up their situation. And so buying public there, I won't have the time to go into this in detail, but uh, I do have a number of articles and other information on this, but the rules of international banking, we have, uh, there's one or two. So when you look at the use that a bank can make of what is happening, then the rules are there so as to allow the banks to cover up what happens and to uh, look at the differences between their own funds and the commitments that they take on. So when you look at the tests carried out, so if you look at the uh, what's happening, 
we can see that they're carrying, carrying, uh, they're covering up the funds. So the it's a ban Pepariba, It's just four percent of their commitments. And so I'm talking about being BNP Pariba, but there are lots of different examples of Deutsche Bahn and many others. And so buying public debt by banks is not just to make as much money as possible. Well, above all, when we're talking about risky countries in the Eurozone, it's mainly because it's safe assets which allows them to cover up their accounts and which allows them to carry out blackmails blackmail among states so between states and private banks so. and so i'll just wrap up i don't know how much time i have left but if you could tell me because i haven't and so I'll just wrap up. So I think that we need to think about some serious questions. So what is a new debt for? So states have been authorized to increase significantly their debt. So French debt went from 100% uh, of GDP to roughly 120%, and that's going to be over the top and Greek debt is just uh, so much more, and also Italian debt. So debt has been increased, but why? Is this legitimate? Is it legitimate to increase public debt in this way? Well, we have to think about this increasing debt, but for why? For what purpose? Is it to create hundreds of millions of Pfizer and Pfizer, Moderna, BioNTech vaccines, which are prices at uh, 20 times the cost of production. Well, that's not legitimate. So if it's uh, vaccinations to save the population, but it, well, okay. But as we were hearing in a remarkable document that we heard about from Imperial College in London, there was an article uh, about the calculations made. Well, so 3 billion vaccines for less than $8 billion. So producing vaccines for 2 euros, 2.5 euros, and uh, they're being paid by Pfizer or the, the European Commission bought, buys them at a much higher price. And so vaccine doses of Pfizer, they're much higher. So is it legitimate to indebt yourself to make a gift like this to the large company owners and to the large shareholders? There are big companies involved here and uh, there are public companies there's Lufthansa that has received 9 billion euros from the German government. And Lufthansa is a purely private uh, company. So is it legitimate to have public debt in this way? Well, is it good to have public debt because you refuse to finance the public state, the public state in a certain way? You should, you should be taxing pharmaceutical companies, and this will be denounced in the press by us. So Moderna, who sells its vaccines to the European Commission at a prohibitive rate, has just created in 2020 Moderna Switzerland, which is based in Baal, and all of the payments will be made to this company based in Switzerland, which actually produces nothing. And uh, we need to ensure that payments go to the right place. We need to tax Google, Apple, Zoom, 
Uh, we have seen, uh, we have this great, we have Facebook, we have Zoom, we have Microsoft, etc. And let me just uh, throw out there for the debate, is it legitimate to continue to pay back the debt held by the European Central Bank? Economists uh, like me did sign the call to cancel the debt held by the, B, the ECB, which uh, accounts for some 25% of uh, public debt. Would it not be appropriate, therefore, to cancel from the ECB's balance sheet the debt it holds, the um, public debt securities that it holds. And uh, I look forward to uh, debating this question with uh, Benjamin and others, and others, of course, who among the participants ask questions. Fundamentally, the goal of such a cancellation would be to remove a weapon of blackmail from the hands of the European Central Bank, uh, the ECB can say, okay, sure, take on debt, but we all know perfectly well that following the presidential election in France, and we'll see how, what the outcome of the German elections are as well this coming weekend, one thing we can count on is that after these elections, M Macron during the presidential election campaign, so right up until May 20, 2022, he will be, be pressuring within the European Commission and uh, on the ECB to not restore financial discipline before he is re-elected. And after he is re-elected, you could count on it that all the rhetoric about um, pulling up our bootstrap, pulling ourselves by our bootstraps and so on, rolling up our sleeves, will be back. Uh, he'll say, well, we've been very generous these two uh, past two years. Now, uh, the ECB will say, well, we need a structural reform plan for structural savings and austerity will come back with guns blazing. And since the ECB holds 25% of uh, 25% of uh, European government public debt, they can use that as a, a means to pressure. But if they don't have that, of course, they'll still try to pressure, but they won't be able to blackmail um, as easily as, as uh, if they uh, otherwise. Uh, and that's why I signed this petition, this call for the cancellation, along with Thomas Piketty and others. I hope I didn't take too much, uh, too much time. Noah, you uh, took the time you required. Uh, I think your presentation was very clear and very useful. And I, I do call on participants who wish to, to ask their questions uh, either in the chat or in the uh, uh, Q&A section. Eric mentioned a number of things. He mentioned uh, a debate that took place that uh, really tore up the left in France, especially on uh, calling on the BC, the ECB to cancel uh, it's public debt, uh, oh, public debt or not, uh, in order to uh, remove the pressure uh, that the ECB has. Whereas others, ben Benjamin Lemoyne says that the the ECB would use such a cancellation actually to demand structural adjustment plan policies from uh, diff from governments. And so this was it was a pretty heated debate in uh, France and elsewhere. So let's just take a look at the landscape. As you know, the ECB and uh, orthodox economists uh, relied on financial markets to impose budgetary discipline on states because you had the Maastricht criteria. You couldn't let debt go beyond 60% of uh, GDP and uh, budget deficits could not pass, uh, could not uh, go be more than 3% of GDPs. And so the, uh, the appetite of investors and I also use uh, quotation marks for investors. I think we're talking more about speculators. Their appetite for the debt of such and such country led inter the interest rates that uh, the affected government had to pay um, in increase or fluctuated based on this uh, appetite of uh, speculators. And so each government was forced to uh, adjust its uh, spending and its budgetary policies accordingly. 
the master criteria have certainly been uh, shattered. Some would say forever. Others say that, well, they have to be renegotiations with the French Minister of Finance says, uh, Bruno Le Maire. And, but since the master criteria have been shattered, the ECB is, uh, has really crushed uh, the interest rate. We haven't seen an increase in uh, the um, ECB's uh, uh, prime rate, uh, the rate. And what we've seen is that uh, we've seen this crisis of public debt in the European Union. And this actually happened before, what we saw there was the before the date debts really uh, went up as they have now, it, this led governments to implement austerity. And um, Aline will be talking uh, to us about this. What, how did European governments react? What was the logic of the reaction at the time of the 2007-2008 uh, subprime crisis, which uh, then became a public debt crisis in the European Union? Uh, over to you, Aline. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Renaud. Thank you for inviting me uh, to this um, discussion. Let me just make a small comment to start off with regarding the uh, theme of today's discussion, the uh, rising public debts. I think uh, really excellent work uh, was done by a researcher at the University of Brazil, Dani Lagabor. For some years now, she has been working on the whole question of collateral. Collateral, uh, as Eric mentioned it, and he talked about this earlier, collateral, uh, basically it's the securities that banks hold uh, such as uh, public debt securities. That's very high quality public debt securities that enables them to borrow money on markets to continue to finance their activity. This is what banks do with their activities on financial markets in, in particular. So the increase in public debt is actually it means more collateral for these private banks. It's actually a kind of uh, fundamental fuel, basic fuel for uh, banks. Uh, there's a good article in the in uh, by Frédéric Le Maire in the latest Le Monde Diplomat Diplomatique based on the work of the researcher I mentioned, Daniel Agabor. And, and it's quite a, it's a, it's a really good article. It really goes into some details. logic. We've seen the building of a system that looks for every possible a solution to uh, to hang on, to perpetuate, to perpetuate itself. So let's let's turn back to 2000, uh, 2007, 2008. We'll look at 2011, and we'll we'll then turn to the present situation, which is a good way to uh, kind of make the link with what Eric was saying just now. So 2007, 2000, I'm sure most of you remember what happened in 2007, 8. And if you don't remember, well, this is how things looked. Huge banks had, had gotten involved in very risky uh, activities, which uh, they had said weren't risky, that uh, supposedly were going to continue rising in value uh, forever and ever. And in fact, it turned out that this was not true and that some had realized, some had realized that things were going awry, but they hadn't protected themselves adequately. And so the day that the bubble burst, many banks uh, went into, basically were bankrupt or on the eve of bankrupt or, or almost bankrupt. So in the first weeks and months of this crisis, we heard a lot about chaos, uh, and this was totally unhelpful. And they were saying either we save these, we rescue these banks and pay whatever is required to save these banks, rescue these banks, these banks are, are huge, we have to save them. Either we 
rescue them or other other thing everything will collapse of course and if everything collapsed there it would be a catastrophe uh, people couldn't find harsh enough terms to describe how, how awful this would be and so you had basically these two two choices uh, we were a rock in a hard place and so the choice that was uh, made was to inject the funds required to maintain to rescue the financial system and to avoid uh, the bankruptcy or the bank failures and people of course said that these banks were too big to fail as was the as was the expression and that their failure would uh, produce uh, unimaginable inimaginable uh, chaos and suffering and that if any one of them were to fail all of them were to fail there would be kind of a domino effect that they hold each other's uh, securities uh, and so forth and they also provide uh, uh, guarantees uh, to one another and so you had to uphold the whole system you have to rescue all the banks and so this uh, revealed the kind of systemic risk that in a network where you have different players uh, uh, of different size, where you had the really big ones, which are of course were the main players, uh, all that was required was for one link in this chain to break, for the whole system to collapse. Uh, it was like uh, a castle uh, built of playing cards. Uh, but in fact, we actually, you can think that, well, this is just fake, it's all virtual, but in fact, we do depend tremendously on these institutions and our dependence on them has grown since 2000, 2008, that we have a payment system, for example, that is maintained uh, and managed by the banks. And so if the banks collapse, well, the payment system will, no, will not work. And so it wasn't just finance that would be hit by this. It, this uh, whole uh, domino effect would take place, not only within the financial system, but uh, the, the so-called real economy as well. And so, but why do I say that uh, talking about chaos or talking about only about being between, between a rock and a hard place, why do I say that that's really, was really the wrong approach and really kind of, kind of uh, suffocated all possible discussion and debate? Well, we, we saw how these banks were, these financial institutions were rescued. There was injection of equity into the bank. That is governments became owners of bank partially or in whole. In Belgium, Belgium, for example, owns 10% of, BN, of BNP Paribas and also an owner of a, a very large Belgian bank You'll find the same thing in the UK, in Spain, and elsewhere in Europe. So huge injection of capital. Just to give you a, a number, it's hard to imagine 453 billion euros in capital that was injected in France, France 25. Uh, these are huge numbers. So we're so used to now in tens and hundreds of billions, even trillions. Uh, nonetheless, these are huge numbers. There were num another approach just to rescue the banks by governments was loans, 300 billion, uh, and then there were guarantees, government guarantees of banks. And what does that mean? It means, well, the government is saying they tell investors and they tell bank, bank lenders that if ever the bank fails, don't worry, we're here and we will... Uh, make sure that uh, your uh, loans are paid back. Of course, all of this was funded not by a magical budget surpluses, but rather by debt. And so if you look at uh, all European government's uh, debt curbs, curves, you'll you see a huge acceleration, huge increase from 2000, 2000 and 2009 and 2010 onward. Another thing I wanted to say about these bank rescues, these bank bailouts, is that many big banks, especially in France, BNP, Société Générale, and others, um, bragged that they didn't need a bailout, that they were very secure, solid, robust, all the wonderful adjectives. In fact, though, the, the, the weak links, uh, they saved the weak links. And 
And if the weaklings hadn't been saved, then the other ones would have uh, come down with them. All this means is that with these bailouts, some banks were targeted and saved and rescued, but in fact, the whole, the whole, all financial institutions were saved. In fact, the whole financial system was saved. This, this interaction, this connection, there are banks, there are, uh, there are pension funds, there are mutual funds, insurance companies, sovereign funds, the entire uh, world, the entire universe of institutional investors, the entire financial system was rescued. Uh, and the people that benefited most, that people that profited most from there were, were the wealthy who hold capital, because when you get down to it, it's always individuals that are behind uh, this, this individual, this, uh, this wealth. But it wasn't an unstable period or, uh, uh, sorry, it was an unstable period, an uncertain period. People weren't sure what would come after these bank bailouts, these, this financial system rescue. And as uh, Eric has said, what's clear is that in such a period, investors are always looking for, for safe havens, places where they can put their money. And uh, one obvious choice is public debt, sovereign debt, but there's also real estate, uh, bricks and mortar, uh, real estate. So that has led to uh, a huge increase in the price of real estate, which we are, we're seeing, especially in big cities. So after 2008, 2009, 2010, the demand for public debt increased. Sorry, let me come back. During this period, there was a need from the investors to buy public debt. So there was a pressure. There was easy money for the states. They could borrow a lot. They could get financed cheaply because investors were really willing to lend. This needs to be added to the deficits of the states, which are being increased by the bailouts and by the social and financial crisis, by the different measures that were taken to absorb the shock of the crisis. This was the case until there was the first shock on the public debt. It started with Greece, then Portugal, Ireland, but the most dramatic example was Greece. And from this moment onwards, all those banks which had public debts in their balance sheet, they panicked and there was a risk of failure. And then there, were there was a second wave of, bail uh, of bailouts, such as for Dexia in Belgium. At this moment, so-called non-conventional policies were implemented. They became the main tool of the moment of the day. And they use monetary creation to support those banks. These were huge flows of capital, of cash, being given by the central banks into the system. Of course, the same causes lead to the same effects. The financial system had not been reformed. It had not been regulated. So states were just adding capital in the same machine. So it was obviously going to produce the same things, the same inequalities. And this is what we saw, an increase in inequalities, an increase in multi-billionaires and an increase in their wealth. We never stop wondering about the wealth. And this was all a result of a massive, undifferentiated and unconditional bailout for investors whom we refused that they would pay the cost of the crisis. The last thing which I would like to say is the following. Well, you understood that the financial system is in intensive care since this period. It's interesting to remind ourselves that 
at the end of 2019, at the beginning of 2020, there were a lot of uh, media articles praising the results on trading of, tra of trading places. But this was also a situation of delirious accumulation of public and private debts. Because the, in a capitalist system in which banks are central, recovery is based on credit, credit to households, credit to companies. And there was such a high level of debt that even the IMF had as the perspective a potential financial crisis. And what was shocking is that while we had arrived at the moment where the bubble was inevitably going to burst, well, at this moment, those measures I enumerated accumulated as soon as the pandemic burst out. And it was a bit as if there were no more limits to how much you can feed this system. Financial bonds were delayed. There were cancellation of constraints on banks and so on. All measures were taken in order to avoid questioning the system. I will stop now and I will take the floor again later. Thank you, Alin. Despite the will of the system not to self-question, we can discuss later on possible alternatives. For example, the possibility for states to get funded without going on the market, without being dependent from the markets. Alina, I was struck by the description that you made of this system, which aggravated the causes instead of solving them. An economist said that the sum of uh, investment and the sum of um, and the sum of money in the banks should be the same. But this does not work. And the increase in public debt increases inequalities and increases the wealth of the richest of the wealthiest. You demonstrated how there's more of a continuity than a break, especially since Draghi's statement, who said whatever it takes, when the markets were panicking, he said that the ECB would support the markets, whatever the cost. So Benjamin, let me turn at you to discuss the current situation in which we should have a view, a look at uh, all that has been done since in the last few years. Thank you, Renaud. Thank you to the CADTM for the invitation. And obviously, thank you, Eric, for putting things into place. It's incredible to see how the pandemic was built as a narrative, as an ex as an external shock. Obviously, this crisis is endogenous. It finds its roots in the fin in financial capitalism and in the potential solutions that were deployed. The hospitals being full of patients is also endogenous to the capitalist system and the dependency of debt of public debt. And you highlighted that well. We could understand the causality in your speech and we could understand how far the public authorities making it look as if 
causality to external is important. And let me remind you that in March 20, 2020 in France, we almost had uh, a, a bond crash So the, the floor shook in the French treasury and we, did, we needed mass intervention in the euro system. So there was a financial crisis looming on the, on the horizon, but then the COVID crisis was used by public authorities to forget about it. The political situation, which was pro-public spending with quantitative easing, is not a majority view, it's only secondary. And I was going to quote Daniela Gabor as Aline did. She speaks of a revolution without revolutionaries. We've seen a transformation in the modes of public funding, but this is not being articulated with what could be a new regime of ideas or a new mode of seeing public debt. These new buybacks rules, they follow a secondary objective, not a political objective. So she says it's Minsky without Keynes. It's Minsky as far as the financial system is being stabilized by the ECB but without Keynes, because the economy is not on the way to recovery through investment and public demand. The state is stuck with uh, investing on real estate and uh, other financial values. We need to ask what the new configuration with negative rates, quantitative easing after 2015 and so on, what this situation can feed. Here, there's a historical comparison that can be made. The, this background can be compared with what happened in the 80s, 90s, and at the beginning of the 2000s, where on the contrary, you had states being financed on the capital markets, and you had a narrative about future generations, about the debt burden, and the liberal and austerity measures that would need to be implemented to be prepared for potential shocks. Obviously, at the time, they could not foresee the massive change of the 2008 crisis and then the quantitative easing and then the pandemic. In these years, you had the idea that by lending money to the states, the investors were voting and the treasury was dependent on the sale of treasury bonds and had to get the approval of capital markets. And when the state would sell its debt, it would also sell promises of structural reforms, of labor, labor code flexibilization. So there was this idea that we would implement public policies aligned on the tool, on the financial tool, but the current situation leads to something else. The austerity discourse on public debt was we had barely entered the first lockdown when the discourse appeared of we need to go back to normal. This is only temporary. This is not the way economy works. Clearly, there's a problem between this discourse and the current way that states finance themselves. As Renaud says, refinancing European states is not an issue nowadays. 
But should we stop here? No, we cannot conclude with such a discourse in which we would be happy with the current situation. And what's interesting is that you've got a lot of people who alarm us. If you look, if you ask a banker, especially a banker who is a primary dealer who buys debt in wholesales, they say that since the quantitative easing, things are very calm. You can find the list of wholesale buyers of debt online. They buy debt and they sell it back to pension funds, insurances, and so on. And those primary dealers, well, their job has become extremely boring since quantitative easing. At first, well, the liberal narrative used to say that, that the market says the truth about the states and about the actors. But this narrative is being questioned by the new, by the quantitative easing. and by the new regime that started since the pandemic. And here, well, again, the narrative is, is to say that uh, this was all a, a small parenthesis because of the pandemic and that we should get prepared to coming back to normal. So let's measure the paradox we find ourselves at a crossroads in terms of the debt order. We can look at the securization of the financing of the state to say that private institutions should not decide on the potential of financing and of investing of states, especially in a time of ecological crisis. Neoliberalism Neo is still very much here. It was barely under shades recently. And let me draw again a parallel with what happened after the Second World War. You also had a competition between two different orders on the one hand, you had the state socializing credit, taking back the monetary and financial system into its control, neutralizing the question of state financing. But there you had forces saying that this was necessary because we were coming out of an extraordinary military conflict, but that we should get prepared to coming back to normal. And here we can see the importance of struggles to define what should be the normal. De facto, there is an important struggle being led to really find the mandate of the ECB to definancialize it to get it out of its current role as a support of the financial architecture as it is now, to take the state out of its role as being a simple emitter of riskless asset. Investors say that the state is a winner in this operation because he can use the money to finance its deficit. But actually, emitting riskless assets has a political cost. 
Indeed, it has no financial cost. Financial cost is being diminished through this configuration. But there is a political cost because the state is being reduced to this role as emitting riskless assets on the financial market. This is not without its problems because the public state the is supposed to act in the general interest. And yet public authorities nowadays are reduced to the role of ECB watcher, if I might say. All the proposals of the French tre treasury are aligned on how the ECB can react to a program of structural reforms. This is why I was saying that neoliberalism was barely put in the shade under the shades. At any time, we can reactivate the tool of watching over the markets when the states go back on the primary market. The fact that the border between the primary and the secondary markets were not broken, this is fundamental. So if we need to fight, then we need to fight on the monetization of debt. And we should try to make effective uh, the securitization of the financing of states and to make uh, financial markets actors uh, neutral, to neutralize them um, so that they have nothing to say. Benjamin, and so uh, it's about what Benjamin was saying, the possible closing of the singular situation that we find ourselves in now. The ECB authorizes itself to uh, close off the markets as it has. And up until now, the interventions of the ECB were to be done to finance the if to finance each of the members of the Eurozone. And so in order to intervene a bit in Greece, you had to intervene heavily in Germany. And now the ECB, well, we can see the way in which they are lowering the level of the way that this market works. And so, this uh, situation, well, I'll just, well, one of the candidates of the traditional right, Xavier Bertrand, Bertrand, he said that one of the reasons why he was promising that France would have just one of his mandates was because he wanted to say, he wanted to say that he would reimburse debt and a, such, such a policy would mean that he would not claim a second mandate. And the violence of this mandate would mean that he would just do one single mandate. So anyway, now we can think about what revolutionaries can achieve, uh, whether they are determined or not, to overcome the blackmail of debt and or to cancel debt or to cancel the blackmailing of debt or to change the ways of functioning and so uh, a crisis related to debt. Well, uh, we now can hand over to Eric and then Aline, you can give us some points and then over to Benjamin. Great, thank you. Uh, 
So we need intervention from the people. formule de, du film d'abord du roman et puis du film Le Guépard où un des protagonistes qui est de l'aristocratie et qui and if a, we look at the aristocracy we can see that if you look at Garibaldi then you can say that everything needs to change so that nothing changes This is a sentence that we've heard regularly. And really, it's about saying that, that everything needs to change so as to ensure that nothing changes. And just rest assured that, as he was saying, nothing will actually change and at least we need to uh, remove certain limitations momentarily and uh, and you can be the only beneficiaries of this because if there were the least change then maybe we would seek some kind of a reduction in the growth in inequalities, but these inequalities have indeed grown and the complete lack of uh, balance in terms of the equalities. And if I just go into the stratosphere and think about the uh, price of this, because this is my true pleasure, well, hundreds of millions or maybe Billions of people in the world are living in a horrible situation in the world. And so, and so this is uh, where we are. And so we can see that, that there's a closing of the parenthesis. And maybe we can try and... Um, prevent uh, the door being closed off, we can try to there is more that we can not turn the back on what would have happened. And if we are to raise the alarm, then we would say that we need to audit debt. And so, if we think at these, if we think of these new debts, well, what is the object to be pursued? So there is an accumulation of wealth which exacerbates the inequalities and the amounts accumulate in terms of profits by one group of individuals, big pharma among others, and uh, banks. It's, uh, well, Well, how is it? How is it that we can uh, create visibility in terms of the process underway? How can we say, don't think about these new sums that are in, accumulated in terms of debt? Well, if we just think. Uh, it's the general sense, but no, really, we have to say that we have to think what is the point of this and what is the point of this. So 
we could say, well, there's a very clear example. If we say to people, the European Commission and these several different member states pay vaccine suppliers 10 times or 20 times the production cost. And then we also see that Big Pharma is using public research, and so they haven't made the expenses or they haven't invested themselves. And how many times have I said that we have to rise up against Big Pharma, but we have uh, we have to say, well, there have to be people saying, yeah. Well, there are some people saying research for development. Well, research for development it may be done by pub, by the public, or maybe not. And so we have to underscore this. And so people like us who work on one segment of debt, and if we try to denounce this, and then we, if we find that we turn the spotlight towards what is happening, and if we say, how is it that the pandemic is to be addressed, we may find that the gifts being given to Big Pharma, well, we should say, too much is too much. That's very important. And then we should think of other points such as justice. Less than 2% of the African population has been vaccinated. And we have over 60% vaccinated in rich countries. And then we're, they're told that they need a third dose. So Big Pharma has permanent income because after the third dose, they say you need another booster in dose. You need another boost dose. And, and this means income for 20 years, basically, for them. So 500% the profit in comparison with the production costs, just imagine. So I think that at the same time, we have an opportunity to be extraordinary and we have the chance to show the people the injustice of the system. And Exactement le everything needs to change in order for everything to change completely the opposite of what this aristocrat in italy said that everything needs to change in order to respond to the increase in, in d'autres inequalities est-ce que je peux t'interrompre sur ce sur cette belle perspective pour changer pour Eric, uh, could i just ask you if we could hand the floor to Benjamin because he has to leave us very soon and then he can speak next time. So over to Benjamin. Yes, I apologize for having to leave, but uh, this would be great. I would have loved to remain longer, but I just wanted to say that one of the first struggles is that we have to understand how in public debate, well, and CIDTM has been contributing for many years for developed countries and less developed countries. So uh, just thinking about the fact that there are these phenomena which we, well, it might be a number of different mechanisms. There is an understanding of citizen conscience. There is citizen awareness, which for so long had been taken on by private actors and uh, financial technocracies. And we could just reaffirm that to finance states, well, that's what they need to do, that they need financing, which is not subject to private uh, criticism. And they could say, well, it's non-risk financing and you're going to have to pay for that. So the non-risk financing, you can be at the top of the pyramid and and it can be you and not the state. And so, well, it's things that can, we can see forms of taxation, capitalism, and 
there can be big advocacy for financial transactions and we can see this excessive uh, and so it, and so a banking and financial system which well we have to understand that it's that there are these big gaps there's uh, there are uh, huge gaps in the state and there's a debt market um, socializing and 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 then we have Wall Street and the and the city of London and we had and there are many solutions to this and there are uh, market mechanisms in place and uh, the cost for the market may be lower when you have one type of debt well you may have uh, when you have debt it can be citizen domestic debt and and uh, with non-financial interests. And this instrument of a massive financing or the European Central Bank. So if we had interventionist governments, if we had governments that had a high level idea Massive. Donc, il faut brancher cet instrument du crédit, cet instrument sécurisé du crédit public, à des formes de planification écologique. Parce que lorsqu'on regarde ce qui se passe, en fait, on a des formes de planification aujourd'hui. Si on regarde ce que nous avons, si on regarde ce que nous avons planifié, c'est un plan de budget, un plan d'austérité, et nous avons créé des bodies indépendants qui auraient des programmes multi-années. Uh, placing investments for for the country. There are several several moderate stages. And uh, ready to set up. But we should look at that plural level. If we look at the, or we could ask for democratic levels of direct investments to have ways in which investments can be invested and to achieve finance, which would lead us in the right way to the next crisis. So now, Apologies, I will still be here to listen to you. Over Merci. to you. Merci, Benjamin. Bon vent quand tu devras nous quitter. À bientôt. Aline, je te laisse la parole. Avec le micro, c'est mieux. Merci. I forgot um, to turn on my mic. Déjà, oui, effectivement, le discours de l'austérité, il revient. Yes. In fact, we're already hearing talk of austerity. I haven't uh, been following things in France recently, but in Belgium, it's certainly the case. So for the past week, they've been talking about austerity. Uh, 
uh, Secretary of uh, State Secretary said that we have to reduce the deficit by three billion dollars by billion euros. I'm sorry, and and the the uh, exceptional period you you were talking about is it will indeed come to an end. And there's a strange background noise. The interpreter apologizes. Um, the, there's a we're hearing a lot about how um, uh, a, even just a small increase in interest rates will open up. Uh, a period of increased austerity. Yes, uh, Eric is Eric Toussaint is saying that there's a strange noise that must that makes life hard, much harder for interpreters, and he was right, quite right to say that. And now we realize what the problem was. Her microphone was rubbing up against her um, her scarf. So she is going to repeat what she was saying earlier. Oh, she's not going to repeat. She says that another factor affecting ECB policies that affects banks, that tech, that affects public policy per se, is that, well, the ECB is quite uh, distant from all of us. There's something, there's, there are very few things that are more, that are further away from us and our control than the ECB. We see that governments have become more authoritarian in any case. And so that raises a number of questions in terms of uh, what kind of uh, how we can influence policies, let alone ECB actions. What would happen, for example, if there's a bank failure if uh, when a government has bought uh, a, a, a government can buy, can buy a failed bank for a symbolic euro, one euro. That's one idea. I'd like to turn just turn my attention to two questions that came up earlier. Questions that I think are really essential for social movements and trade unions. Uh, the first is a, a goal, which I think is essential to reduce our dependency, reduce our dependence on financial markets, re reduce our, limit our dependence on anything that has to do with capital accumulation. Let me just give you one example, pensions. When we have a system that works a system that works on the basis of social contributions that goes into funds funds that are then used to pay retired workers pensions there's a, a, an amount that is deposited into the fund and then immediately goes to to a pensioner goes from a worker to a pensioner via this contribution fund however if you are go to a a, a market-based solution a financial market-based uh, uh, solution uh, because of uh, the attacks on social security or because of uh, the rhetoric says that people are living too long after retirement, that this creates too much pressure for the public pension system. Of course, there are all these arguments. This has led to a growing role of uh, um, superannuation or market uh, financial market-based pensions. So what happens is that you in, you accumulate uh, in your own personal account, supposedly for your retirement, that goes to the financial markets, that increases the amount of money in the financial market, financial markets, that increases demand for financial market products, that therefore increases prices. And there's a kind of internal need for this just to keep turning, to keep working. You have to dragoon as many people as possible into this type of system. And that's why you have these huge uh, battles around pension reforms. Just before the 
lockdown, you had these struggles against the privatization, uh, the ref pension reform. That's where there have to be major battles, major struggles around pensions, around public services, around health care. That is the way concretely to reduce our dependence on, dependence on financial markets. Why is this so important? Well, as soon as we are dependent on these systems, we become complicit in a way. We begin to defend interests that are not our interests. Uh, we don't want bank losses to be to be borne by uh, people uh, who are involved in the system, and that's us. Well, maybe we have some money in our mutual funds on the markets or uh, private pension funds, and so we somehow become, in a way, become complicit with these big private financial market players. We feel that we're squeezed, that we have to accept these bailouts, these bank, these rescue packages, bailout packages for private uh, financial market players, financial institutions. The second point I wanted to make is that I think it was Eric was talking about neutralizing markets. Neutralizing markets means lowering the pressure from markets. We have to stop adding capital into the markets. There's this social component of capital that comes from people, people who get dragooned into financial markets. And there's, of course, there's monetary creation. We don't have much control of that, but we can try. There's also the need to recognize that we can actually, we have the potential to destroy capital. That is, what does that mean? What I mean by this? by not continuing to feed the beast, to feed the machine. I think we should see the non-repayment of debt as a way to destroy capital, because when debt is not repaid, you reduce the amount of funds that are on the market that are looking for outlets. You reduce pressure on people, on work, on bodies, on ecosystems. It's a way to reduce the overall pressure from financial markets. So how can we do this? First of all, I think we have to start from what affects us, what's important for us, what weighs on us, as it were. For example, housing, such a central question. It's one of the main uh, types of spending for most households. And when you're a renter on the private market, well, what does that mean? It means up to half of our working time just goes toward uh, paying back the owner. And so this is constant, these constant financial flows, and this did not stop during the lockdown. One thing that did happen was that here in Brussels, there were, there, there were public payments for private households to help them pay their rent. Some about 200 euros per month was given to people in Brussels to help them pay their rent. And of course, this money just went straight into the pockets of the owner the same problem. We have to really cancel to stop some of these financial flows, to stop this hoarding, this appropriation, to reduce the pressure we all feel from financial markets. Just to wrap up on this point, I think it's really important, and I'm, I'm not particularly, I'm not saying I'm very original when I say this, others have worked uh, on changing the narrative, changing by not, by, by starting from what we need we should, and by being less dependent and by destroying capital in order to reduce the pressure from financial markets. Thank you, Aline. Thank you, Eric and Benjamin. Benjamin left uh, and he was scheduled to leave. I have a lot of questions. I'll read uh, them out. Uh, uh, Eric, uh, Eric and Aline, uh, you can answer them as you wish, in the order you wish. Uh, I'll read out three questions. We still have another 20 minutes. First question. What authority could actually ban speculation? And, and do you have any precedents? And would it be possible without modifying the Lisbon, without uh, 
amending the Article 123 of the Lisbon Treaty to carry out direct monetization of the European Central Bank. As to create a body similar to the National Council, National Credit Board that uh, one of the speakers talked about. And in the US, there's a lot of uh, talk of creating public banks within the current monetary, but that would remain, they, they would remain within the existing public system and financial system, monetary system. Is that uh, a possible solution here in Europe, the creation of public banks? Eric, would you like to start? Yes, sure. Yes, my mic is on. You can hear me. Yes, we hear you loud and clear. Well, it really depends on countries. Which country you're talking about in, in Europe? Up until about 1870, speculation was banned by law. And Speculatist capul ca speculating capul capitalists persuaded legislators. Uh, this was still just a kind of uh, landowner's vote, right to vote. To They convinced them, persuaded them to remove this ban on speculation. And, and so the, the question was, uh, how could we ban speculation? Well, you can ban speculation by law. A law could say, for example, that an asset or a property cannot be acquired in order to resell it at the highest price, that an asset is acquired to be used. And it's the, and it's the use value that becomes central. If you acquire, uh, uh, housing, it's to live there. It's not to make money off of it. If you acquire a certain amount of oil, it's because it, it will be actually used within a given time period. It's not actually very hard to, 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 to lay out how uh, speculation could be banned by law. The, that was the first question. Secondly, is it possible to violate the treaties? Well, the ECB, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission, when they felt that the situation was uh, urgent, they, they didn't uh, abide by the treaties themselves. And so it's already happened. <laughs> the current treaties uh, are actually suspended right now. In any event, I'm not... I don't think we should be passive and docile um, in any event. Were there to be uh, opposition to a government taking an initiative that would ask its central bank, whether the French central bank or the Belgian central bank, to, to finance spending? Well, we, that, that would require disobeying the treaties. And the, it, the problem would be, uh, the ball would be in the, the European Commission's court. You may recall, it wasn't very long ago, you might recall the negotiation between the U UK and the European Commission on Brexit. Who, who, I, I have no sympathy for Boris Johnson whatsoever, but it was the European Commission that was constantly uh, making concessions to reach an agreement. So from when a country opposes or disobeys it's really the, this really creates problems for the european commission and since there are very strong arguments in favor of doing things that are contrary to the treaties i think we're entirely legitimate to demand such things on on the on public banking i think aline aline would have something to say about this uh, on a, in a neighboring country uh, to uh, Belgium and France called Germany, half of the banking sector is in public hands. If, if you go to any tiny, even the tiniest of village, there's what's called a Sparkasse, uh, uh, a savings, a public savings office. If you go to Luxembourg even, which is a big uh, tax haven, you'll see 
the you'll see uh, another public savings office of the Luxembourg state. And so there are public banks in Europe and they work uh, just fine. But I am actually for the socialization of the entire banking sector. I think bank, BNP Paribas, Crédit Agricole, Société Générale should be dismantled, taken apart, broken up. They should they should be made into a public service with local branches across the length and breadth of all of France, even the tiniest villages, and they should be work in the service of of the French population. The Aline, if I may, I'd like to just add two or three words on the question of public banks and socialization of banks. Yes, of course, please go ahead. At the CADTM, we uh, brought out an issue of, uh, uh, of, our, new, of our publication uh, on the question of socializing banks. It's, uh, it's, a, quite a, it's quite a quite a thorough document on the question of socializing banks where we defend the, uh, the whole notion of socializing banks. It's, it's good to hear about, um, thanks for talking about uh, the work that's being done in the United States around public banks. A number of things have come out. And one thing I have questions about, and it's true that in Germany, there are a number of public banks. There are a lot of co-op cooperative banks in, in Germany, but uh, as in the UK and in the United States, but but the the but there's a kind of a for some reason the pub, the idea of a public bank isn't very attractive. It's it's like it's a as if it's some kind of old dinosaur, a dusty dusty old thing that doesn't work, that is not at all appealing. And so we somehow have to work on the in our narrative in our in the work we do. We have to, I think, uh, work on making this uh, uh, something that's attractive, that's appealing. It gets a public bank could be really great. It could be a huge step forward. I think Benjamin was saying this earlier. When you look at the amounts that are involved, how much people, how much debt is uh, taken on to finance uh, recovery plans, and yet you have banks that have tens and hundreds of billions of, of uh, euros on their uh, on their books and if they were to uh, direct this these funds to somewhat less stupid me ends uh, socially and environmentally useful ends you can imagine the progress that would be these private banks do not at all uh, have as uh, as an aim the improvement of uh, uh, public welfare and environmental welfare if you had a public bank uh, or if you had, if you ha, uh, had banks that had clear goals, uh, proper government governance controlled by the population. Uh, for the time being, though, we have very little control over what banks do and what the ECB does. But there are indeed banks that are public property. Uh, I mentioned a, a, a bank here in Belgium, Brefus. Uh, uh, it, it's a public bank. It would be nice to say, oh, that's great. But Belgium basically manages this, lets, lets the bank manage itself uh, along the same lines as a private bank because the, because the program of this bank after it was taken over, after it became a public bank, was not changed from what it was uh, as, a pub, as a private institution. I, I, I remember an activist once told me, I'm not, I don't want to fight to take control of this. Banks are so disgusting. I remember this exchange I had, and, and that's why I say that. I think we have to work on making the whole idea of public banking more attractive. I don't have any I, clear ideas. How can we make public banks, uh, um, uh, how, how, how can we make public banks more attract, a more attractive option, uh, getting public control over these huge sums of credit uh, uh, that's so essential for achieving our aims. Uh, our, our political adversaries are happy to hoard wealth, but they're also happy to hoard concepts such as bank and they've banks and, 
and and uh, people only see banks as those disgusting, awful institutions that uh, brought uh, that created uh, that cursed catastrophe. That uh, people can't see banks as anything else but private enrichment and speculation and uh, and uh, Lord knows what else. So. Uh, so how can we work towards a, a world that works in a, in a better way? How can we uh, take control of shadow banking? Uh, shadow banking accounts for some 30, 30 times the total global GDP. I think that figure seems plausible. It is not controlled by governments and states. What can we do against shadow banking? Uh, could you also say a few words about Iceland maybe? which uh, managed the 2008 crisis in a somewhat different way. Those who were, who were responsible for the crisis locally were actually sued, were taken to court. Did Iceland uh, handle handle things different? Iceland handled things different uh, during the coronavirus crisis as well. And this is probably the last round of questions. I have a general question. How can we change the terrible current relationship of forces if we on the radical left do not take power, how, how can we lead to a progressive uh, surpassing or overcoming of uh, the capitalist mode of production? Uh, this is a question that uh, has been bothering me as well. Aline might want to start, however you like. No, Eric, go on. All right, so the shadow banking is out of the hands of the states because the states decided so. It's not difficult at all to enact legislation which would prevent any company that pretends to have a banking license. to develop vehicles, as we call them. These are companies that are linked with shadow banking. So it's really not hard to define what we do not want and then to ban it legally. Shadow banking is the shadow of the bank. It's not entirely separated. These are systematic creations by the banks themselves who create their own shadow in a way. So if you say to the banks that from now on, all shadow activities are banned and that if they do not respect this, then their banking license will be taken from them. Then they will have to respect the rule. And that's a lesson from Iceland, by the way. In 2007, 2008, under the pressure of its population, the Icelandic government, the Icelandic government was put under pressure by the population because the first reaction of the government was to make concessions to the banks. So there were people's mobilizations, which led to a referendum and strong measures were taken. And three bankers were even convicted and they went in prison. They actually went in prison. You know, when we say that we want to ban, we want to forbid capital movement, people always say, but uh, how can you control that and so on? Well, Iceland actually banned capital control back then. And Icelandic capitals stayed in Iceland. Because if you say that whoever, whichever person, whether physical or a moral person, 
who contravenes to this legal rule will be brought before justice, then they have to respect the rule. Apart from that, I must say, I do not know what's the position of Iceland towards the World Bank, so I cannot answer this. Now, on the last question regarding the radical left. Well, I believe that we need a radical left able to present a program which can actually be implemented when they come in the government. Often the problem is that they do not apply their program. If you look at Syriza, which I know well, because as you know, I worked a lot with Greece in 2015. The problem with Syriza is that it renounced to apply, to implement its program. So the problem is that if you have no mechanism for people to be held accountable, then you have a reproduction of what has happened already in history. What we would need is for social movements and political organizations to agree together on a program. We as CRTM work towards that and we need strong in commitments by the governments up to the point that it should be brought down if it does not respect its program. We need a real dialectics between the political power and the social movements. We cannot just give a political organization uh, all power to do whatever they want. All right, that's it, I'm done. I would like to thank the organizers and I would like to thank Renaud for moderating this discussion. All right, Aline. Well, first of all, I have a question. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. Well, okay, I'm asking because uh, my screen just flipped down somehow. So I, I can see myself upside down and I can see yourself. I can see you upside down. It's kind of amusing, but well, if, if you can see me, that's fine. Right. Well, if only we had a solution, a full scale alternative. But still, even if we don't, something that motivates me is that we can have this discussion and that this discussion happens within many movements, movements who understand that if we follow our struggles up to victory, decolonial struggle, ecological struggle, social struggle, whatever struggle, if we win, then we'll bring financial defaults. Capitalism needs permanent expansion in order to survive and in order to keep expanding. Financial markets need to continue to expand to get profits. So if at some point expansion is made impossible, or if we manage to force a setback for capitalism, then we'll arrive at a point with strong with strong um, earthquakes and uh, where there will be financial defaults and so on. So we need to say that the financial system needs to default. But the thing is that we need to anticipate the moment when this happens. 
it's important to put back the topic of the financial and the banking systems on the forefront, on the center, so that we can discuss and be prepared so that next time it happens, we're not like, oh my God, this cannot happen. We cannot save them again. So we need to have a plan for those who are wealthy enough to carry to carry the burden of the losses. If an investment fund defaults, it also means that some people will lose money even though they don't have that much money. That we also need to have in mind. So we also need to think about that. We need to think about every aspect. In my mind, we have to go through these discussions, these reflections together and to go beyond the contradictions that exist within the trade unions and the associative movements and so on. For me, that's also my last word. Thank you, Aline. Thank you, Eric. Let me conclude. So the Icelandic lesson is a lesson of people's mobilization. I believe that here we all agree that we need to get intellectual weapons to understand how our political adversaries work and how they make us fools. If you allow me to quote Carlos Fuentes, we never managed to convince a ruling class that their last hour had come and that they should get used to it. This makes our task complicated, but I believe that everyone who participated in this debate agrees that we should take part to this task. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to the CDTM and see you soon in those struggles.